During the Pleistocene, ground sloths were among the most widespread and successful mammals of the New World. Sloths are members of the mammalian superorders in Narthra, which is a major clade of placental mammal that evolved and diversified in South America during the continent's long period of isolation. Although today sloths are only represented by a few small, tree-dwelling animals, by the Pleistocene, large-bodied sloths had diversified into a wide array of ecological niches, including large grazers of open areas, forest-dwelling mixed feeders, and giant high-browsing animals. However, Despite being common in the fossil record, relatively little is known about the social behaviors of these extinct sloths, as they have no modern analogs. The extant species of sloth are all exclusively solitary animals. However, as extant sloths are small, relatively inactive, and highly specialized for a life in the treetops, they do not bear any resemblance to their extinct, ground-dwelling relatives, and thus provide a very poor comparison for behavior. Instead, ground sloths were much more ecologically comparable to ungulates, with a wide array of niches and thus, almost certainly a wide range of social behaviors. In southwestern Iowa, the remains of an adult Jefferson's ground sloth, Megalonyx jeffersoni, have been found in association with those of two juveniles. Additionally, one juvenile seems to have been older than the other. It seems that this association between an adult and juveniles represents a female sloth and her offspring. Thus, ground sloths seem to have cared for their young for extensive periods of time, to the extent where one offspring would have overlapped with another. In Ecuador, the remains of at least 22 individuals of the giant ground sloth Arimatherium laurelardi have been found in direct association within the same thin stratigraphic layer, implying that all of the individuals died at roughly the same time and in the same place. The place of death for these animals seems to have been a stagnant, marshy pool of water. The mass death is likely attributable to disease, drought, or poisoning of drinking water by algal blooms or other toxins. That so many giant sloths died in the same place at the same relative time seems irrefutable proof that at least this species of sloth was social and lived in large herds, potentially well exceeding 20 members. Additionally, the sloths recovered from the mass death site include sloths of different ages, with juveniles, adults and subadults, and senile individuals all being a part of the supposed herd. Thus, these sloth herds seem to have been intergenerational, comprised of both the old and the young, as well as prime age individuals. Other instances of mass death assemblages in extinct ground sloths have been discovered for the genera Lestodon and Catonyx. These groups seem to have been somewhat smaller than those found of Arimatherium, but the same general premise is highly implied. The species of ground sloth found were social, and lived in intergenerational herds. Thus, group living in extinct sloths must have been very common, and most species of ground sloths probably lived in herds. As ground sloths were a diverse group of animals, occupying a wide range of ecological niches, their social behaviors must have also varied widely. Typically, extinct ground sloths are grouped into six distinct families. Megatheridae, which includes the giant ground sloths Megatherium and Arimatherium. Nothrotheridae, which includes the Shasta ground sloth Nothrotheriops shastensis. Mylodontidae, which includes genera such as Mylodon, Paramylodon, Glossotherium, and Lestodon. Scalitotheridae, which includes Scalitotherium and Catonyx. Megalonicidae, which includes the Jefferson's ground sloth Megalonyx jeffersoni. And finally, Megalochnidae, which is the family that includes the Caribbean ground sloths such as Megalochnus and Neochnus. Mylodontid ground sloths and the Scalitotherid ground sloths seem to have variously formed herds of moderate sizes, probably comprised of around 10 or so sloths. Group size likely varied among these sloths considerably. Both the Mylodontid and Scalitotherid sloths seem to have mainly inhabited grasslands and open woodland habitats and herd living seems to have been an adaptation to these open areas. Open spaces allow for larger numbers of animals to congregate than enclosed habitats. Herd living in ground sloths would have allowed individuals to lessen the threat of predation in exposed open areas by having more individuals to detect the threat, and likewise, larger numbers makes the threat of predation less strong for a single individual. Crucially, sloths could collectively defend their young in a herd, 
therefore allowing all individuals within a group to benefit by increasing their reproductive success. Additionally, herd living in herbivores can have competitive benefits, and the application of resource defense to better ensure access to food for members of a group. The giant megatherid ground sloths, namely the tropical Larimotherium and the temperate megatherium, seem to have been the most gregarious of all sloths, living in very large herds that could have consisted of more than 20 members. The megatherids also mainly lived in open habitats, but were selective browsers, and thus herds probably traveled considerable distances in search of preferable food sources. It seems likely that many species of ground sloths may have thus even been migratory. Multiple herds of ground sloth may have congregated around preferential food or water sources, as do herbivores today. Sexual dimorphism may have also played a role in sloth social dynamics. Often, in ground sloths there exists a large, robust morph and a smaller, more gracile morph. Typically, the size difference between the morphs is small, perhaps suggesting that competition by males for females was often not particularly high. Though it is compelling to immediately denote the robust form as male, as is the case with essentially all large herbivores today, that females would have been the most heavily built sex is not impossible. Indeed, females are larger than males in extant sloths and in a select few other mammals. Interestingly, it seems that male and female sloths possess differential feeding adaptations, implying that the two sexes of extinct ground sloths were segregated, using their environment in different ways. Thus, the males of many sloth species may have lived separately from females, disassociating from their herd at maturity and only converging with females during breeding season. Among sloths, the giant megatherid ground sloths were the most dimorphic by far, with the robust form being substantially larger than the gracile and arimotherium. If the robust sloths are male, then this could imply that male giant sloths may have competed more intensely over females, with individual males fighting for dominance over female herds in order to ensure their own reproductive success. It is possible that this may have even taken the form of a dominant male giant sloth controlling a harem of females, which he would defend from other males competitively. Interestingly, the auditory morphology of the extinct ground sloths indicates a focus on hearing sounds of a lower frequency, the implication being that ground sloths use low frequency sounds to communicate. Such bellowing communication is effective over long distances, and herds may have been able to communicate with one another over vast areas most promisingly for an adult to secure a mate. This would be useful for herding animals that travel long distances in search of optimal habitat or foraging territories. This likely describes numerous species of ground sloth, namely the giant megatherids. It is not clear to which degree the Nothrotherid sloths were social. As individual Nothrotherids primarily used dens for protection, they likely may have not lived in very large groups, instead associating more loosely or even being solitary altogether. However, as open habitat sloths, it remains possible that they possessed some social habits. Curiously, Nothrotheriops was not sexually dimorphic, which could imply that they formed mixed herds which were comprised by both males and females with no segregation. It likewise is also not clear to what extent the smaller, Caribbean megalochnid sloths were social. It seems plausible that, as a response to a habitat which mostly lacked large predators, they were able to disassociate into looser groups or even become solitary. Indeed, while most ground sloths may have been fairly gregarious, there seem to have been some species which were less social. Forest dwellers, such as the megalonicid Jefferson's ground sloth, would have been less conspicuous to predators and thus faced lower risks of predation. Likewise, densely wooded areas facilitate lower congregations of animals than do open areas. Indeed, as aforementioned, a seemingly solitary Megalonyx jeffersoni has been found in association with what are assumed to be its two offspring. However, in an earlier species of the genus Megalonyx, two adult individuals have been found together with four juveniles, implying a slightly more social lifestyle. Thus, the closed habitat megalonychid sloths seem to have lived in small family groups, comprised by one or two adult females and their offspring. These forest sloths seem to have been more secretive than some of their more gregarious, open habitat counterparts. 
It is thus clear that ground sloths seem to have possessed a wide range of social behaviors, in accordance with their also wide range of ecological niches and high taxonomic diversity. Ground sloths in open habitats seem to have been largely social animals, living in herds of variable sizes in order to reduce the threat of predation and collectively defend their young. Forest-dwelling sloths seem to have been somewhat less social, having led a secretive life in either small herds or solitarily, with the probable maximal group size being a family unit comprised by one or two females and multiple offspring. Thus, ground sloths seem to have been comparable to ungulates in that they possessed a wide range of behaviors corresponding to different ecological pressures and habitat structures. The premise that these bizarre yet charismatic beasts may have thundered the not-so-ancient landscapes of North and South America in numerous herds makes them that much more compelling and the relatively recent extinction that much more saddening.